All right, good morning. I uh, appreciate the invitation uh, to be here. Uh, I enjoyed David's presentation. Uh, it, you know, it, it is good to keep up with what's going on. Uh, the city of Nashville has got a document that they're working on, which is best management practices for landscapes. And uh, they sent it out for review, and I was looking through it a couple weeks ago. And one of the sections in there was, uh, was titled Reduce or Eliminate Turf. And in the section it said that turf is unsustainable. Uh, to which I I had to write a response to the sea horticulturist. And uh, I like to forward stuff like that to Dr. Samples to get him stirred up, <laughs> which I did. He says I'm a grenade thrower. But uh, anyway, it is there are you know there are people that don't understand your industry for for instance. Uh, how many of you knew that Vanderbilt has a turf team? You might know that. They do. Uh, this is no joke. <laughs> they have a lawyer, a psychologist, a sociologist, and a hydrologist on their turf team. And they have a big grant, an SF grant. They, the project, they call it the National Yard Project. You can, look, you can Google that and look it up. Uh, it's basically uh, an anti-lawn care uh, group, and their goal is to uh, do research on the um, opinions and thoughts of homeowners on lawn care and use that to shape policy concerning lawn care. So that's, that's interesting, and I have met with them. It's an interesting group. So it's good to keep up with things that are going on, and when you get a chance to comment on things, do that. So let's look at uh, look back at 2009 and just look at uh, this is kind of the lightning round of some things, and I'll get more into this one. Anybody recognize this one? Anybody have any impatience to go down this year? Yeah, down in Mildew, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, lots of this disease last year. Do you recognize it? powdery mildew. Uh, this one could fool you, but you see this on perennials most often, occasionally, a woody plant. This is in a garden center. Uh, this is uh, foliar nematode on coneflower, but uh, usually we see this on shade level perennials. How do you diagnose this? Look at that leaf over there on the right hand side where you've got angular spots. But notice that they're green before they turn brown. There's nothing else like that. Uh, so that's a good sign of uh, feathered nematode. Of course, the lab would take that, chop it up, put it in water, and the nematodes would come right out of that tissue. Uh, the main thing here is, you know, if you're buying perennials, just look for damage like this. You don't buy, uh, you don't buy this plant. When you see anything that looks odd on a plant, even if you don't understand what's going on, there's usually a reason it looks odd, and it's usually not a good sign. Uh, a lot of uh, Rebecca is used in the landscape. Common fungal leaf spot here. This is septoria leaf spot. Uh, this plant seems to tolerate this pretty well. Not a huge problem, but if you had a client that didn't like this, just about any foliar fungicide uh, you could use to control this if you applied right when it starts to show up, you have to repeat several times. Uh, this is daylily rust. We saw this at a garden center last year. Uh, not something that we, we see it occasionally, not too often. Uh, the good news is that generally this doesn't overwinter in Tennessee. Uh, as you get further south, it will overwinter in gardens, but uh, you get the rusty spots. If you handle the leaves, you get rust spores on your fingers. And anybody recognize this one? This is a, this, this is a pathogen that hits lots of plants in the landscape. Uh, this is actually southern white. Southern stem rot. It, you know, if you've ever had tomatoes or okra or peppers in your garden, wilt and die. It's often from this disease. If you again, if you look at the base of those plants, you would see white. You'd see white mycelium just like you do here. Uh, one of the things, that one of the big uh, ornamental diseases, is boxwood blight. We have not seen in Tennessee, but the pathogen that causes boxwood blight will also attack this ground cover, back to Sandra. In this case, this is not boxwood blight doing this, but uh, it's a disease, disease called body blight. And 
Uh, generally we see this in, in Pakistan, but it's in full sun. If it's uh, in the shade, you just don't see very much of this. But if it's in full sun and stressed, you will see the leaf spots first, and then it hits the stems and just, it just wipe the bed out. And then this is a real common one on dogwood. This is septoria leaf spot. Uh, not a huge, this is not really a problem unless you're trying to sell to somebody that, does, that finds the leaf spot objectionable. But this is not a huge issue on dogwood. It tolerates this very well. Then a couple of tree things. Uh, we see this every year on honey locusts. The older honey locusts get it seems to be more susceptible to this scanoderma, this fungus that hits the right at the, the butt of the trunk, the scanoderma butt run. And then we still, even though Dutch M disease wiped out a lot of elms, we still see, as you travel on 40, I 40 in West Tennessee, you'll see elms that are going out every year, grounding out. Uh, Dutch M disease is a common cause of that. Uh, fairly easy to diagnose. You get streaks in the sapwood, wilting of the foliage, and uh, over there on the right is the fruiting body of the fungus that we look for, real easy to identify, Dutch M disease. And then a tree, a problem that's become more of a problem uh, in urban areas is bacterial leaf scorch. Uh, we see this a lot on uh, oaks in the red oak family, thin oak, uh, but we also see it on sycamore too. So if you know, if, uh, you know, a lot of times people see this and they think it's an anthracnose disease, but it's, uh, it's not. It's a bacterial leaf scorch. And we usually see this in trees and uh, you see it in residential areas, but you might also see it in a commercial landscape area too. And then occasionally we get weird stuff like this sent to us down D. Uh, this is uh, called the lion's mane fungus uh, heresia. So uh, if you're not familiar with us, uh, Frank and uh, Debbie Joins. Frank Hale, they'll be here later. Debbie Joins is here. This is going to speak later, and I'll work at the Full Plant <coughs> Test Center. Uh, if you haven't followed us on Facebook, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, Frank and I put up a lot of information about uh, things that we're seeing in the landscape, and we put it up uh, on a daily basis. If we see something today, it goes up today. So, uh, the easiest way to find us would be if you could go to our website. I do have a handout. It's on the table out here, out through the doors here on the table. It's got all the, all the websites that I'm going to show you. It's on that handout. So, grab the handout. Don't worry about writing these down. But uh, what we try to do is put up, uh, when, you're, when you're diagnosing uh, a disease problem, insect problem, it's a visual art, so the better the illustrations you have to compare with what you're looking at, the better off you're going to be. So we try to put good illustrations of the things that we're seeing the day we see them, or within 48 hours that we see them, so it's real timely. Frank puts up a lot of good insects, so if you want to know when Japanese beetles are active, uh, or other insects, you can uh, just check us out and see what you're seeing. And all the images that we put up last year are still up uh, under the Photos tab on the Facebook page. So uh, you might want to check those out. And uh, if you click on one of those photos, the only bad thing, and Carol Reese has uh, uh, asked a couple times about this, but uh, unfortunately it's not searchable. Uh, it is browsable. If you see something that looks interesting, you can click on it, and the original post comes up with the caption that we put with the image so that you know what you're looking at. Okay, a few things on turf. Uh, I mentioned this in September when I was down, and certainly we haven't seen any since then, but I'll mention this again because it was the number one turf question that we got uh, on diseases last year. How many of you saw this uh, last year on Bermuda grass, the, the smutty seed heads? Anybody see that? We got more calls about this last year than anything else on turf. Uh, mostly residential areas where people were complaining about the, the black spores on the seed head, uh, discoloring shoes, socks, kids, pets, carpets, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, there's no fungicide that's labeled for controlling this. Uh, what we most uh, frequently suggested was just increasing mowing frequency to uh, cut the seed heads because that's really the only part of the plant that the spores show up on. Uh, otherwise, you're looking at to, Often this is patchy in occurrence. You might go in with Roundup and kill out the area where the smut is because it's a systemic infection. And then either resod or plug or seed. Or in Middle Tennessee, what we suggested was that where lawns are often a mix of grasses, that you kill out the uh, 
spot infected uh, Bermuda grass in, the, in August and then just see what tall fescue, which is a non host. <coughs> so that was interesting. So basically, this is just what I told you. There are no fungicides that are labeled for this disease, so you've got to look at other ways to, to deal with the free clients. Uh, Bipolaris on Bermuda, we saw this uh, last year. Uh, it kind of popped up uh, all of a sudden in September when it cooled off just a little bit and it was still wet. But what you look for, I mean, you could very easily say this looks like melting out or fading out, uh, which is probably a really undescriptive term when you're talking about turf diseases. But what I look for are the leaf spots on the leaves. You get purple leaf spots. So that's one of the easiest ways to define bipolaris. What we look for in the lab is we'll take uh, foliage like that and often by the time we get it, it's pretty far advanced. And you see the fungus that's sporulating here and we blow that up, that's what it looks like. So with this disease, you often don't get a patch because it's producing spores and a disease that produces spores, you're gonna see more of a generalized thinning over a larger area. And then some more shots of spores. So, uh, most of the fungicides are labeled for leaf spot on turf are, are very helpful for this and sometimes you can get amazing recovery after applying those fungicides. This was a, a guy in, in Nashville contacted me last year where he had seeded Bermuda grass and he called and he said that it was fading out. Uh, well, that's not exactly how I described it, but essentially what he was describing was a just classic case of melting or fading out where the grass was being uh, killed and uh, so uh, the interesting thing is that he, he told me he said I you know I contacted you about this last year and you told me what to do and it didn't work and I thanked him for another try at this so he did I said See, bring a sample in so he did and uh, what we found was a fungus called exorhylum uh, which you know it looks very similar to bipolaris that I just showed you in a lot of ways it acts in the same way now we don't get leaf spots like we did with the bipolaris on the grass. Uh, it's just kind of browning out here. But if we looked at these brown leaf closely, uh, the fungus is all scattered on that tissue and lots of spores are being produced. And again, we don't have patches because it's producing spores. They're dispersed over a larger area. Uh, so what I suggested, I talked to Maria Peterson down at Mississippi State and uh, get her thoughts on this. And she said in her research plot, she had seen this before. Uh, had used heritage and it worked very well. So what I suggested was that uh, that he contact a lawn care company and uh, pay them to apply heritage. Now he contacted me, he said it worked very well, and he was very happy. Not only did it stop the disease, but he said even the areas that looked brown and looked dead, the grass came back. So he was a very happy customer. Uh, the interesting thing is that he called me uh, several weeks later uh, remember the fungal meningitis stories on television, the steroids that were contaminated with fungi? He's like, did you see, and I said, yes, I saw the story. The most common fungus found in those steroid shots was exorhylum rostratum. The same fungus I just showed you that was causing the melting fading out on the grass. Of course, the main thing he wanted to know, was there any danger? And uh, so there, there's really not, uh, you know, there are some plant pathogens, there are also human pathogens, but it's very rare, very rare to see that. However, there is one more that I will tell you about. This is a very common fungus. This is probably one of the most common fungus, fungi in the world. Uh, it's called Schizophyllum communion. It's a wood decay fungus that you see on trees often that have been hit by flat-headed boars that Frank will talk about. You get these little white uh, mushrooms growing on the trunk. Actually, this fungus, uh, has been reported to cause all kind of uh, brain abscesses, sinus infections. Uh, there was even a story of uh, some kid that had even the mushrooms growing through their sinuses into their upper palate and their mouth. Uh, but again, this is very rare, but maybe something you could talk about at the dinner table tonight when you're discussing <laughs> what you did today. So let's talk about current threats to landscape. Uh, downy mildew in patients is big. Uh, early last year was found, uh, I'd say by May, uh, even before that, by this time of year, last year, downy mildew was just wiping out in patients, garden patients in Florida in February. And uh, through spring, we didn't see very much. It was still in Florida on the Gulf Coast. By um, July, end of July last year, 
uh, downy mildew was found all over the eastern United States in landscapes and greenhouses. And the reason for that, two means of spread, moving infected plants around and have the mildew on it. And the other way is this fungus produces so many spores that they can actually be transported by air currents. And then a rain event, we have, you know, if the spores are coming over this part of Tennessee and we have rain come through, uh, the rain will knock them out of the sky. And if they land on, you know, patients are going to infect them. So the, the reason this is, uh, this is big, no, a couple of reasons. Number one is that garden patients are usually the number one or number two bedding plants sold in America. For most garden centers, sell bedding plants is often 15 to 20 percent of their sales for the year. Uh, but it knocks the leaves off and no leaves, no flowers. So customers are not happy. And uh, this was the first case that I saw ever. In 28 years, I've never seen downy mildew on any patients. Uh, it's a new disease. It's new to Europe, and Europe it has essentially uh, people have discontinued using this plant and as a bedding plant in Europe because of this disease. You can't get rid of it. So what you see unlike the powdery mildew where you see white fungal growth on the upper leaf surface that's on the lower leaf surface. And what we see are these, these structures from spores. So these little spores are blown, can be just blown short distances in the same bed on the same plant or longer distances. Um, and then this is what you get. This is in Knoxville in August 1 of last year. A landscaper that had a big, a nice client in the Sequoia Hills area of Knoxville <coughs> and had lost all their impatience due to downy mildew. This is in Nashville in October. So essentially what you get are just stemmy plants with no leaves and no flowers. By this time in October, the bad news is what we were finding was a different spore stage. And the stem tissue, if you took it and sectioned it, it was full of these spores, different spores. These are other spores. And they're going to overwinter in the beds where it existed last year. So if the patients go back in those beds, they're going to get infected, and then the disease will spread from there. So this is got not good news. The question I often get is, well, why can't you just replace the soil in the bed? Well. Even if everybody did that, it probably would not work, but just doing that in a local situation is not going to control this disease. So for 2013, in the Midwest and Northeastern United States, where they've dealt with this for two years, a lot of growers are cutting back on garden patients by 75% or more. Now in this area, I'd say they're not because it was not identified. A lot of people just thought it was due to the drought or some of the reason that their impatience fell. So they're going to continue to grow them. And I think demand will be there. But I think we're going to see a lot more down in mildew this year. And uh, what I've told people that grow bedding plants is hang on to your, if you don't sell the begonias, hang on to them because people are going to be back looking for something to replace their impatience. So the resistant plants for this disease are New Guinea patients. Sun patients are also resistant. Coleus is resistant. And just about any type of begonia is resistant. This fungus is very specific to the host that it hits. So, so that's not good news, but uh, that's where we are. Some people in Knoxville, large greenhouse there's not even growing garden patients this year. They're going to a seeded uh, New Guinea patient and growing it because it's resistant to downy mildew, the divine uh, series of New Guinea impatients. Uh, Paul Hort has done a lot of research on this. There are good guidelines for helping growers produce healthy plants, but that does nothing to protect the plants once they're out in the landscape. So I think you can have the happiest plants in the world to sell this spring, but I think what we'll see is we're going to see a lot more of this this year. And if people have several years of failures, then they're going to quit buying the plant. And that's essentially what happened in Europe. It will probably take uh, it'll take years, if not decades, to develop a resistant impatience to this disease. Where did it come from? Uh, in the U.S., it probably came from uh, Europe. We had a greenhouse. If you follow our Facebook page, you know that last week we put some photos up of the first greenhouse in Tennessee where downy mildew was found this year. So it's already out there, and it was just caused a habit. Uh, boxwood blight. I'll go through this pretty quick uh, because we haven't found this in Tennessee yet. But if you see, basically, if you see this on a boxwood, we'd like to know about it because there's no other disease on boxwood that causes these leaf spots like this. Now, if that's all it did, no big deal. But 
this is what it will do. It will continue killing the foliage until it's killed all the foliage on the plant. If it does it's several years in a row, then you've lost the, the plant. Now, boxwoods have been pretty dependable, other than leaf miners and maybe a few other things. It's not something that we have to spray very often. So we really, the only way that this is going to get to Tennessee is for someone to bring infected plants in. Uh, again, the leaf spots on the leaves are what you look for. On the underside of the leaf spots, you might see some white fungal growth. It's not downy mildew, it's a different fungus. Uh, but these are things that you would look for. What can it do in a landscape? Uh, it can knock all the leaves off of boxwood. And again, like most of the plant diseases that we see on ornamentals, once you see this, it's too late to spray. Now, could you keep a healthy plant uh, healthy using fungicides? Yes, but you're not curing diseases. So the main thing I'm saying here, be extremely cautious if you're buying boxwood this season. It's still out there. There was a nursery in Virginia that had a problem with this. Uh, not probably the big nursery you're thinking of that sells a lot of boxwood, but another nursery had a problem with this in 2011. They got rid of all the infected plants. They used a flamethrower to burn the field down and burn all the plant leaves that had fallen off to try to kill the fungus. Came back in, in October 2012. So once you get this, it's very difficult to get rid of. So especially if you have anybody, if you're doing any boxwood replacement for people who have old boxwoods, you would want to be familiar with this. You would want to maybe, if you buy some boxwoods, maybe quarantine them in the area of your, your compound or shop for a week or two and just watch for the symptoms. Uh, and the bad thing about ornamentals and fungicides is that fungicides don't cure diseases, but what they are sometimes good at, they're really good at masking symptoms. And that's why you would want to quarantine without spraying for a few weeks. Uh, to see if it pops up. So uh, Kelly Ivers is kind of in the heart of where boxwood blight has occurred in western North Carolina. She's done a lot of work. This is on your handout, if you pick up a handout. She's got some information on cultivars that seem to be a little more resistant to this. If it becomes a problem here, that would be good to know. And also some fungicides that you could use to keep healthy boxwood healthy. Uh, but there are other things that we see. We see Vitella blight. Different fungus, similar, but different fungus that I just showed you on the Pachysandra. But you get pink to salmon colored spores here. But otherwise, the symptoms would be a little bit similar. But this is not nearly as serious. And then the other thing that we see are uh, root rot problems on boxwoods. Generally, you'd see root rot, most likely than a newly planted boxwood, where you see some branch die back like this. And if you check the roots, they're going to be discolored uh, due to root rot. So again, if you're buying plants, especially if they're in containers, slide them out and look at the, look at the roots and, and see what's there. Uh, and then, uh, nothing really that new on, on, on rose rosette, but we still get lots of questions about it. Uh, the bunchy grub, the knockout rose and other roses. This is a carefree marble rose, uh, actually in my yard, that uh, got rose rosette, where I had not seen it in several years close by, uh, but it was infected. This is vectored by an erified mite. Uh, it's a huge concern because knockout seems to be so susceptible to this uh, disease. But we see a lot of the roses. This is on the ferry, some odd growth there. Uh, this is uh, a mass planting of knockout rose, lots of bunchy growth here. All the plants are infected. And uh, probably the big question we get are when can you replace? Now, there was a big webinar on Rose Rosette recently, and, uh, and I was going through the transcript of it last night. And the big question is, you know, when, if you see rose rosette, match planting on knockout, which is wiped out, when can you replant? Well, this, this planting was pulled uh, about a year ago, and this immediately replaced, and they went from knockout to pink knockout. Uh, was that a good idea? May not be a bad idea, but the thing that you have to understand about plant viruses, most plant viruses do not survive outside the plant. So there's really no danger of planting into the soil. Uh, the, what about the mite? The mite, uh, probably of all mites, here five mites, probably more sensitive, I guess, maybe to extremes, but uh, unless there are mites hiding out in this bed, and there could be uh, not much chance of it being spread again. So right now, uh, there's really no evidence to say that you should wait two, three, or four years to replant. Uh, disease progression. When you see a 
the planning of Rosary is at. This is in Murfreesboro, Davenies. Uh, everything's infected here. This is August 2011, last year. Uh, just a few months later, uh, in May, lots of dieback on the same planting. Plants just are not storing carbohydrates. It prevents the plant from storing starch as necessary for putting out the next flush of growth. So, uh, and then at the end, it, it sort of looks like this. We've got some uh, research trial that we started this past year. It's going to be a little while before we get any really good information, but we're looking at pruning the spread of the virus and mass plantings are the way to stop it, ways to slow it. Will miticides work if you control the vector? Uh, is that doable? And Frank's looking at that. So hopefully we'll, we'll let you know. We've got some plots that we've started up in uh, Cumberland County where we've, we're doing the research. And then also on woody uh, diseases uh, due to the drought last year. Anytime we have a drought like we had at the end of May and through June, you're going to see dieback on woody plants. And the dieback is a combination of a fungal infection that's localized and also due to stress uh, from the drought. Now, uh, if you have landscape crews and they're out doing some pruning, one thing that I would tell them is anything you see dieback like this on a Juniper, upright juniper, cypress, laurels, really anything, boxwood, anything that's evergreen that's showing dieback, go ahead and prune this out. Number one, it's not going to come back. Uh, I mean, if, if this is dead to here, you've got the canker starting right in here. If you don't do anything, it's going to move down the branch and cause even more damage. Now, what you can tell your crew is this. If, if we go on, if we on our property that we maintain or we go on other people's property and we're doing pruning, we're going to prune the healthy plants first, then we're going to prune the diseased plants last. If we do that, there's less chance of spread between healthy and diseased plants. But this is always worse after a drought. So, uh, in July, we were seeing damage like this uh, commonly in the Nashville area and I'm sure elsewhere that Leyland Cypress is planted. Some of this could have been prevented, uh, well, Irrigation during the drought would have been the best prevention. Uh, but even at this stage, uh, it could have minimized if he had gone in and pruned this out. By November 5th, uh, it looks like this. So what the fungus does, it continues running down those branches. When it gets to the trunk, everything above that branch, you lose it. But the main way to prevent this is irrigation during drought. Drip irrigation would have been great. It's not anything you can do now. So on cypress, you'll see die back like this. If you cut away those branches, you see the canker is right in this area where you see the sap of the resin flowing. But it's already gotten to the trunk, so it's too late for this tree. So again, if you see, if you have a crew, whether it's on your property or somebody else's property, and there's die back like this, on an upright juniper or cypress, tell them to prune it out. Because if you don't, one year later, uh, it's going to look like that. Once the fungus gets into the main stem, the tree is essentially done. So that's a simple thing, uh, but just good, good rule of thumb, and they don't even have to know exactly what's causing the problem. There are other fungi on the side. This is, well, that was Phomopsis there. This is Ceridium canker on Lanolin Cypress. But it really, you don't have to get it identified. It really doesn't matter. They work, all these fungi work in the same way. They're hitting stress plants. You're causing branch time back. You want to stop it as soon as you can. And then we also see similar damage on uh, plants like azalea and rhododendron. Different fungi. It could be phomopsis. It could be a fungus called Bacteria. But again, if you do not move this out, uh, it's going to continue killing, moving down that stem until it gets to the crown of the plant or the main stem, and you're going to lose it. So print it out as soon as you see it. So, really preventing, and people don't like this because they would like for you to be able to come out and spray something that would make everything like it was. Uh, and that's just not the case. It's not going to happen. So, if we look at what we could have done differently, again, it's about maintaining host vigor. And at these points I have covered. And uh, I think that's where I'll stop. I've got a couple minutes for questions. Any questions? Any questions? How many of you saw Danny Mildew last year on the invasion? Okay. How many of you saw Danny Mildew last year on the invasion?
How many of you saw impatience last year? You probably saw Danny Mill, did you? Uh, because I had, a, I had a guy from a company in Nashville that came in in September, and they do a lot of color beds at apartment complexes in Nashville. And I said, do you use impatience? He said, yeah, on all our properties we use impatience. I said, how much Danny Mill do you have you seen? He said, none. Well, I showed him the slides I just showed you, and uh, he went out and looked, and he called me the next day, and he said, well, I, I checked 12 properties, we have it on six. He said, I thought my guys had just pruned the impatience funny, uh, but it was actually Danny Mill who was doing that. All the photos that I've showed you today have been posted on the Facebook page at some time or another uh, this past year, 